I have to add <coughs> a few comments what I was saying last time concerning the issue of the C dot closure of the space of a matrix of matrix G with a given sign of the curvature. Right, so there are two spaces when they were something greater than or less than. And uh, the point I make, the statement which I made, that this space is closed. And this is dense. And there are, of course, two different ways how we can think about that. You can say, well, that's very good. And this is very bad because this tells you that looking from very far away, you still can detect positivity of the curve. You go very far away, all kind of differential thing disappears. You look from afar, and this corresponds to that. On the other hand, you can, of course, change perspective, yeah? And say, on, on the contrary, once you know that, you know everything. All matrix, they're dense. So it's subject completely reduced to just to matrix in general. So you forget about that. And, and, and this says, well, you don't know what to do. And so this depends on what you want. So this is the end of the story. You know they're dense and probably have nothing else to add. And you can say the question is finished. But this is opening. It says, ha, now something is there. And it depends what you like. Actually, I have a question. For the second question, incidents, is it homotopy class type of the space? Yeah, the here, here is everything. Yeah, yes, homotopy type is just contractible. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, contra contractible. It says uh, the, the theorem of Lecamp in this kind of, in the, uh, is the philosophy of, of general phenomena that usually differential inequalities, when you impose the inequality of the type, usually it that tells you nothing except what involved into uh, uh, topology of this inequality. And this here topology is, 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 is simple. And so this had a different perspective. And <coughs> originally, this question was raised a long time ago for symplectic geometry, when it was unclear if the same thing is true about the group of symplectic diffeomorphisms. There also it was. It's not hard to show that there are two alternatives. It's either it might be C not closed or C not dense in the space of all volume preserving transformations. And therefore, they were ex exactly depending how you are oriented to perspectives. And then eventually, Ashbrook, after many kind of oscillation back and forth, shown they're closed, which indicated simplicity geometry exists. It doesn't tell you what it is. It says it's, there is something in there. And then subjects are developing. In, in, in kind of geometric sense. Of course, the word geometry has different meanings. For example, I think the papers on symplectic geometry, already I think by, by Siegel, whatever, are understood in a very algebraic sense, but completely kind of oblivious or completely kind of perpendicular to this perspective. When you look from very, very far away and see what you see. see in classical calculus, you do opposite. You, you look microscopically, and so you look at essential perturbation of the linear systems, infinitesimal perturbation. And calculus goes this way. But what is remarkable, of course, is that correct algebra, if algebra is so nice, it usually indicates when you go to the weak limit, and still it survives. But that's exactly, exactly kind of the point. So, 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 so here, in the, in the case of scalar curvature, it is closed. And as I said, there are two proofs. And none of them is kind of straightforward, the same as in the symplectic geometry. There is no kind of straightforward proof, because it exactly tells you something happened there, and the something must be detected. OK, now I want to describe what are so the main topics in there. And when I, uh, I just I prepared this, something I will put on, on the web. Uh, later after the lecture, new version of that, and I thought it would be five, six, seven, whatever. But when I wrote, now I think it's eighteen or nineteen. So it's very kind of uh, quite developed field, and some of them are very developed, and some are less developed, and some only beginning. But there are amazingly many directions, and uh, <laughs> so the two major, which you may find in the literature direction, one is about positive mass theorem. 
which I explain again here. Oh, it used to be a conjecture in the Manian geometry, which is kind of geometric and motivated by, by uh, general relativity. And in fact, in general relativity, you can find the germs of very many things which has done afterwards. In particular, because that's a relation between minimal surfaces and the scaly curvature. <coughs> And another one related to cyst algebras, <coughs> index theorems, and Novikov conjectures. So these are the most kind of developed fields, which in there you have a huge amount of, 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 of kind of papers. And um, which I know only tangentially. I must admit, and I know tangentially, I kind of cannot say mu too much about that. And, um, and so let me explain wh what's in there, and just what they kind of correspond to to, 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 uh, to, to two different masses involved. And so there is the following kind of. So one, of course, I say the theory of conjecture. Maybe I say what it is because it's underlies many, many um, ideas. And uh, knowledge of conjecture in its kind of uh, simply simplest form. So, so, so I have to say too, this is this kind of great similarity yeah, between the two subjects. Though we don't quite understand what they are, there are some formulations saying they're kind of in certain reformulations, they become equivalent, or one imply another, but in truth, it's not so, right? But I just say, so I have to say two words about that, because I will be referring to this pretty often. So, so, you, have, so you have to distinguish when it's concerned manifolds x, compact manifolds of dimension n and large n. Yeah. For, for lower dimensions, it's kind of, we must be careful what it tells you. Now one knows, and this is kind of fundamental theorem of Brown and Novikov, that that homotopy type of X doesn't tell you anything about the tangent bundle of X. So, so from homotopy type and tangent bundle of X are e essentially independent except for one relation, namely the signature of manifold, which is some signature of quadratic form for four-dimensional manifold intersection of the cycles of product homology. So it's quadratic form, it has signature. This signature, which is homotopy invariant, equal to some Pantheonic class, which is invariant of the bundle completely uh, regardless of, uh, of anything else. Uh, any bundle has Pantheonic classes, some invariant of this. And that's the only invariant. So this is this, uh, this relation. Uh, uh, yes, follow some Kaborism theory of, of Tom. This is Tom Hirzebruch kind of formula, but it is the only relation if you allow torsion. Yeah, if you add here some constant multiplied by some constant, I don't know, it's like n factorial. Yeah. And then, uh, in the, then you know there is nothing else. But if it's smaller than n factorial, actually, it's really the power of torsion. And then. And that's what kind of remarkable, but it, and you can think, well, that kind of the end of the story, you understand simply connect manifold, and then for non simply connected, you kind of there is some kind of formalism, and, and the wall kind of developed it, and as if you have parallel theory, but in fact, it's completely different because, because when there is fundamental group, the world changes. You have kind of more, more structure, and the simplest instance of, of this conjecture, which is unsolved, and is kind of sufficiently representative is that if you have a manifold X where there is nothing but fundamental group, namely such that this is contractible, and this is universal covering of that. So this is, you can think about like Euclidean space divided by gamma. So all, all homotopy information is in gamma. Then all Pantheagin classes are homotopy invariant up to scaling. So it, it means that if you take this tension bundle X and take it sum with itself, say n, n times, n factorial times, or something big number of times, this bundle will depend only on this group gamma. 
So once you know gamma, you know all characteristic classes. And this is still open. And on the other hand, this is kind of a tricky situation because there is huge literature about that. And, uh, and we shall see scaly curvature, the parallel equation for scaly curvature, more or less like that, which says if you have a, this kind of manifold, it carries no metric with positive scaly curvature. But this, of course, very weak statement compared to that. In fact, the, which is kind of a little bit maybe deceptive. And uh, there are kind of reformulation version of this Novikov conjecture, which I come li to li later on, where kind of it become formally more general than what I said about scaly coverage. But that's, you have to have in mind that. And so there's something here in the group, teaching and something about the group. And actually, the theorem can be formulated entirely in terms of groups. You can forget completely about a topology and geometry, some kind of algebraic property of group. You can formulate it, and then you can prove nothing. That's amazing. So you can say, aha, uh -huh, topology reduced to algebra. Something about groups. When you have to prove something even about groups, you have to go back to geometry, even more than topology. So all theorems of this kind, whenever it's proven, proven by geometric means. Sometimes they're hidden, ge geometry sometimes hidden, and it's, it's some algebraic tracing, uh, very kind of deceptive. And uh, not only it's unproven, we don't know whether it's proven or not. There are many, many theorems of a different condition when it's true or not. Well, we don't know if this condition is equivalent. We don't know if one implies another, except for some cases. And maybe all cases already covered, we don't know. So it's a completely chaotic situation. And there is more and more papers on the edge of this chaos, for all I understand. And the basic results, uh, so there was original papers, long, long papers by, by Lustig and Mission case, very unclear if anything was done afterwards. I mean, lots of things were done, but the class of groups to, to which it is, it applies unclear. And we don't know whether the problem is the message, the property of the group. And the same with scaly curvature. But scaly curvature has extra, extra points to it, which is in, uh, invisible here. So, but this, to understand this, you have to look at the methods. And, and, where is, where is it? And what, what they prove. And so there are two parallel lines of kind of reasoning, and one related to minimal varieties in general terms, concerning scaly curvature. And here is Dirac operator. So, so you're talking about the proof of what now? The, I will discuss what you do with scaly curvature and what you do simultaneously for, 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 for a signature for, for, for Novikov conjecture. So there are two things. So these are methods, and here is for scaly curvature. Here is for scaly curvature. And the parallel thing for the Novikov conjecture, this will be splitting theorem, coming back to Novikov, how we prove something. And here it will be signature operators. But the question is where these operators act and on what kind of index theorem you need for them. This is more geometric, but if you, it's amazingly how closely can we can go from one to another. You see. But every situation here, there is parallel situation here, and there is no formalization despite certain claims. Some people say, oh, well, we have Jerome theorem, they just only because they narrowed the field. So, and this is kind of rather easy to explain. And, and, and this is also easy if you know what Dirac operator is, and, but of course, we are not supposed to understand what it is. Now, so maybe I shall formulate again in the form the positive mass theorem because it simulated that. And say this minimal surfaces uh, and in physics, we can see it all the time and the various names, which I'm very confused. I, I'm just very scared, kind of aware of using physical terminology, which I don't understand. But the simplest form of the so-called positive mass theorem, and as we know, in a way, in, in a way, uh, covering all possibilities, modulus some sim relatively simple argument is that if I have a manifold, complete manifold of positive scaly curvature, such that outside of some compact set is just Euclidean space. 
then x is asymmetric to Euclidean space. And, and uh, physicists, of course, formulate it in, in, in differently. They have idea of a mass of a space, so there is a space containing some amount of mass somewhere, and you want to look at infinity, what this felt from the point of view of, of general relativity. This, of course, a space slice, so it's not the whole kind of like the whole, not the whole space time. And so they defined mass in a way I must admit I never uh, unable to understand. I haven't thought about, about that. But here, at least, this kind of mass is zero. For flat space at infinity, mass is supposed to be zero. But 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 the, the point is that you cannot make this deformation. Of course, for dimension two, it's kind of more or less obvious. Yeah, if you have which means there is convex surface flat infinity must be everywhere flat. But for high dimension, it's quite tricky, and there is no quite simple proof. And as, that, as, I, I, as I mentioned before, there are probably seven or eight somewhat different proofs. They're closely related but different. They're based on different phenomena. Is it radial mass you're talking about? Hmm? You know, it's, it's just a flat space, so you don't have to suppose to know what mass is. Yeah, the, the mass here is just this is the terminology called positive mass theorem, origin in physics. Why so? I don't know because I don't understand what mass is, right? And from point of view, of certain point of view, that typically it was written, it was not satisfactory because it was written in particular coordinate system, it was not invariant. I, I have some guesses. I will explain it in a second. So, so what it's what it means, yeah. On, on some examples, right? So, and the, the the method to prove that is to use some kind of minimal surface around them and reduce it to some, in this case, usually to the gauss Barnett theorem, right? So this would be, can be eventually, and I explained it today, how to reduce the gauss Barnett theorem for surfaces. Modular certain manipulations and I'm, I'm just certain. I think this was, a pro uh, uh, for example, if Gauss Bonnet was at the, at the disposal of physicists when they formulated that. I don't know the history because uh, physical papers I can't, I don't understand the verse. But that mathematical statement. And um, so, and, but, uh, but, but, but uh, alternatively, you can prove this in, again in many ways by using Dirac operator. So minimal surfaces we understand. So let me explain, explain how the proof goes here with this particular theorem, say in dimension three. And uh, so first, what you do, you reduce it to a compact case, which is in this moment you use very strongly the geometry to infinity is kind of Euclidean therefore periodic because you can say well you don't lose anything if you just take huge torus and this perturbation was inside of the metric of the torus. So I can say aha we have a torus now flat torus and this perturbation and secondly I say why, why it should be like that perturbation so I have just any torus say in dimension n now dimension 3 and it has a metric g and g has positive scary curvature And I say it's impossible. In fact, it must be flat. So let's let's prove that. Yeah. And this, I think, was more or less formulated by Gerach. And, and more or less, I think, the proof was already implicitly some steps of the proof were in the physics literature. And uh, the, 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 the Thibault is not here because he said that there are certain formulas which are systematically used in physics and they were not used used by diverse geometers, but here this formula is essential. And so I, the formula you have to know, besides the gauss Bonnet, so the gauss Bonnet says that if you have a surface, so all I have to know that if I have a surface of a genus bigger than one, and I have it is scaly curvature or gauss curvature, which up to a factor two is the, the same, this integral for, for this one is negative. And if a genus bigger than one, it is strictly negative. And you even don't have to know the specific value of that. One thing you have to know. But some technical statement which will be go inside, which is kind of obvious, right? On the other hand, that was always for, for, for mathematicians was a kind of up to point it was a really a problem. Because they were earlier and I'll formulate it and, and then 
And it says you have, like, for example, you have a torus of dimension three. And you take a homology class surface there, which is not homologous to zero. Then there is another surface inside, which is minimizes area in this homology class. So yeah, I push it, push, push it. It cannot shrink, so it must stop. It must be minimal. It's kind of obvious. It was kind of unknown for a while. And there were papers in geometry when people proving something, kind of trying to bypass this difficulty. And, uh, and then at the moment, but, but by, at some moment, it was proven that always in every homology class, there is minimal surface. Minimal really minimizing the area. Right? And the moment it was proven, yes, everything else became just playing with formulas, which already were ready. But somehow bringing this together was a big kind of point made by Shen Yao. They brought these points together. But I'm curious how much it was already done by physicists. Except, and, and, uh, and so this is the fact. So what you do? So imagine you have this torus with this point of scalar curvature. So take some homology class, minimal surface. So what you know about this surface is homology. This surface must have genus at least one. It cannot be, it cannot be, uh, cannot be a sphere, right? Because, in the, because universal covering is contractible, you lift up sphere, become contractible, it might be non-zero homology class. So the theorem, kind of the technical theorem, as we have to prove is that if you have a manifold of positive scalar curvature, I don't care what happens outside. I have a surface inside, which is minimal. Then this surface is sphere. It cannot be anything else. Right? And, and this is kind of an obvious reformulation. And, and the original paper of Sean Yao, they're proving, they gave their own proof of existence of this minimal surface. So it was long paper. You know, these people, they always kind of write very kind of difficult, hard papers. And so they even proved that, but at that, by that time it was not really needed, it already was known. But they proved in, in a certain way, because at that pe time people were very wary about that. They were, you have thought the whole difficulty of mathematics is there. Once you know it is there, you just take it for granted. Right? But in fact, when you go to high dimension, it still remains a problem. So what exactly happened? happened to high dimension from this perspective is, is, is not so clear. And now what you have to show that if you have positive scalar curvature on the ambient manifold and there is minimal surface, then this integral, so, so imagine so you have manifold scalar of this three-dimensional manifold, say positive, and this is a surface, what you have to prove you have to prove it spherical by showing that we would integrate scalar of the surface, call it y, it will be positive. Right? Now, if you just take a minimal surface per se, it is not true. Right? Minimal surface meaning, meaning, again, there is a point in terminology. When you take minimal, it says it is kind of locally minimizing. If you take restricted to this little ball, it's minimal, it's minimizing, and which is equivalent to the vanishing of the mean curvature. Right? But it doesn't tell by no means it has the minimal area. For example, if you take equator in the three sphere, and this is S2, it's of course minimal, it's, it is locally kind of flat and minimizing, but globally you can push it, become smaller. Right? And this the point and and, 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 uh, and and the key point again it was used again before but never kind of to this extent before by Badan uh, Yao, you use the fact it is absolutely minimizing so when you push it it becomes only it may become only bigger and so you write down what happens there and this is you take a surface you move it by normal direction and see how area changes. And this is called, called second variation formula. And of course, it's, I'm pretty certain physics literature was done. But in, 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 in mathematics, it was not written. So I just write it down, because I, I, I always have tendency to forget it. And so what it is, so the point, of course, eventually, you, you bring the formula to the shape that, so if you have scaly curvature of the ambient space, is positive, then 
this so this 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 quantity, the second derivative of area, is smaller than the integral of the scalar curvature of x of y. This is y surface. Yeah? And because and which makes this integral positive. Right? Because this must increase, right? This increases. So this must be positive and therefore it must be sphere. And in the, in the general formula, so just yes, me write it down, is that it is actually integral So what's involved into the second derivative of area? It is integral over y. And here is 1 half scalar curvature of y minus scalar curvature of x and minus uh, something else. It is integral of the second fundamental form. I know. So some extra term, which is by its nature, is uh, here squares, integral of somebody squares. And so if you know to have this inequality, you know this positive, this disappears, this positive, this disappears, so you have this inequality. And so just me explain so, so how, how this works, yeah. So just it's very simple meaning to that. So so this formula, you said this is the exact formula of the second derivative of the area? Yeah, it is the formula of the second derivative. Okay. So you have a one half? So it's one half different between two scalar equations minus also square of the second fundamental form. So you need a one half to there? Yeah, it might be also one half. But because it disappears, yeah, I think it's one half also here. No, no it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's a, a material, it's a negative here, it disappears. No. Whatever coefficient will disappear at this stage. Yeah? No? So again, yeah, maybe I'm missing something what you're saying. No, I just said here there is one half from the from this inequality here. Here, one half. Ah yeah. Oh, yeah. You're right. So and so this is essential formula you have to have in mind. Yeah. What happens when you deform when you deform uh, surfaces? And, and the general formula may be as follows, because it will be useful for Again, yes, I put them on these four formulas already in what I put on the net. And this is the, fo the following thing. If you have, again, any submanifold, and you start, take this normal field when you deform it. So it's y of dimension n minus 1 inside of x of dimension n. And you move it first by unit vector field, normally. And then multiply it by any function. So it may go up and down, but this is your infinitesimal variation. Of course, you must be careful because this is not extremal. It's not minimal. It actually depends how you, you, you move. And this is you move along normal geodesics. Right? If you change, take another vector field. With, uh, another kind of extension of this field, you can get a slightly different answer, right? which is, of course, will be this term will be 0 if it was actually minimal surface. And the formula is as follows. It is will be one term is will be quite clear. It will be integral of psi of differential of psi squared over i. Yeah, because before it was constant, so it was a zero, right? It was not present. That's kind of a novelty. And the rest is, is what I said. It is plus integral of here. And here is 1 half scalar of y minus scalar of x. Minus the second fundamental form squared. Everything here, 1 half, yeah? Squared. And there is a, an extra term, this one. And this is a mean curvature of the manifold. 
And the mean curve, as you see, it's sine. So if you change the vector field, it will change the sine. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's mu, not mu. And again, if it is minimal variety, this thing disappears. Maybe it's a square. Maybe it's a square, because it's quadratic, let's say. Yeah, type safe squared, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Time, safe squared, absolutely. There's a quadratic expression under this deformation. And this is a formula. And this is kind of exactly in this fo it was, uh, form it is used. And uh, this is, yes, keeping in mind that makes things very, very clear. And I guess it's, yes, what Tibor was saying, this was kind of standard formula in, in, in relativity. And of course, in geometry, it kind of was used, but not, not in kind of system not as kind of having not sufficient prominence it deserves. Yeah, it's kind of a basic formula, one of the basic formulas of geometry. And actually, you can prove it by pure thought, without computation, right? Yeah, from symmetry, from some, some for, form of symmetry, knowing the scalar curve, which is it kind of has linearity, and uh, this metric is flat up to some term, ta -da -da -da, and, and, and then you have to normalize the coefficient in some example, like circle on the plane. If you check it for circle on the plane, it is correct. And therefore, this one half come because you differentiate r squared becomes 2r in this 2. Uh, this is why 2 come here, because of the square in, 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 deri in derivation. What, what do you have uh, the information on mu? Hmm? What do you know about mu? No, mu is a mean curvature of your manifold. If it is minimal, zero. For minimal surface, this term will be zero. But we shall meet situation in some time when it will be non-zero. Mu is some function x, x. But, this, but this is deformation for anybody. Yeah. And this gives you kind of a, a, a very good relation between these two scalar curvatures under motion. And this gives you really some non treat in my view, kind of can be viewed as definition of scalar curvature is inductive definition. If you know what a scalar curvature of y, you know what a scalar curvature of x, because all other terms, you see, they are simpler. Right, they don't involve kind of curvature. This second fundamental form it depends only on the first derivative of the metric. It doesn't need second derivatives, and also these terms don't depend on the second derivative of the metric, which is not surprising. All integrals involving scalar curvature with any weight don't involve curvature anymore. They depends only on the connection itself. This kind of fundamental fact, you kind of because it's linear, because scalar curvature is linear in the second derivatives. So by integration by part, you can shift or eliminate one derivative. But only one derivative, not the second one, you see? So it's easy from that to conclude that scalar curvature is sign or its value is stable and the limit in C1 topology, regardless of the sign, whether it's positive or negative, right? C1 limits of metric, though a priori, uh, curvature dependent on second derivatives, preserves scalar curvature. But it can go one level below. So that's the, 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 the formula. And, and, and how this formula can be used to prove something about manifold of scalar curvature in high dimensions. So what you have to know next are, so this is kind of Clear. So for, for, for the three-dimensional case, we've done it. And so we this proved this version of the positive mass theorem with space flat and infinity. And then you may ask, aha, what is it in general this mass and, and how it is? So this is a theorem. This is some definition of a mass in physical literature, whatever it is. But then there is a theorem of Lockham, which is saying that if I have a space and mass is negative, and manifold has positive scalar curvature and infinity, mass negative. Then I can deform the metric keeping, just outside of compact set, keeping scalar curvature positive and making flat and infinity. And so you don't have to know what mass is, if and only if. So sine of the mass uh, uh, tells you if you can flatten or not flatten it. So everything comes to this point. But now let me give justification of that. So and try to consider model examples. And to also understand the meaning and the why so he is to speak about this much. What is Locke theorem? Hmm? What does it say, Locke theorem? 
it says that if you have uh, x is Riemannian manifold, complete, scalar curvature is non-negative. Say, I would be more slightly more comfortable to say positive. Yeah, if not negative, you might be more slightly more careful. You can reduce it in this case, but it, you might be slightly more careful. Say positive. And its mass defined, you don't know what it is, at infinity. is some price, asymptotic property of it is at infinity is negative. Then you can deform the metric outside of compact set, keeping its scalar curvature positive, and such that it becomes just Euclidean at infinity. Right, and if and only if. So the sign of the mass has this interpretation. And this is done by kind of elementary linear analysis. It's kind of, well, kind of a little bit of a mess, but this is routine, yeah, it was. And uh, there was some, you know, there were some preliminary work done by Sean Yauke, partial just a reinterpretation of that, but this is just linear analysis, essentially, or close to that. But just to understand it, let's try to look at other kind of model cases. So, so you don't have any uh, assumption of topology at infinity? No, absolutely not. No, no, it's, it's, it's Euclidean. It's Euclidean space. It's symmetric to Euclidean space. So it's opposed to automatically standard infinity. Inside, maybe anything. But, but at, at infinity, just Euclidean space. And I'm saying that enough, the case in, in, in many respects, enough to understand flat really at infinity. And this is just Lecomte, 1999, I think, through this. It's called kind of funny. Something about scaly curvature in hammocks. So actually, I didn't know this word. So what about the hammocks? <laughs> and uh, so in, in, in this paper, you know, the ham, you know, he's a really, really, really very strong, it's highly non trivial. He proved, he proved other theorem, kind of more, more, more difficult than that. And this was just little kind of remark, and it was really in people in this relativity for quite a while, they didn't, were not aware of that. And this is. Well, so this is quite, quite significant kind of observation. You see, it killed lots of work because we really people like, like Witten and Sean Yao, they spend a lot of energy handling this infinity, and this role is just immaterial. It just reduces subject much easier by things we already know. And for that reason, maybe they, he's not cited enough. But, uh, but what is kind of meaning of this positive energy, and what is can be justification of that? Look at much easier situation of a conical geometry. It looks like a sphere, and you, you may have cone like that. It may have flat cone, or it may have cone which got a more than two pi angle. Yeah, it grows faster. So these cones will have positive curvature. They are convex, and so in particular they have positive scalar curvature. This is flat, and this will not have po positive curvature. Have, uh, uh, altogether have negative coverage. However, I'm saying, and so what about mass? Mass must properly scale, right? So in, in, from physics, physics point of view, you scale this metric by constant, mass multiplied by the corresponding constant. And these are scale invariant, cone. So this mass will be plus infinity, and this mass will be minus infinity. So you go immediately out of physical range. So what happens, and, and then you can observe that this is one. You cannot flatten it, yeah? You cannot turn it around make it flat. But this you can, right? Because you turn it in, inward. When you go inward, it become more convex. When you move something in this direction, you create convexity because it was opening more than Euclidean space. Come back to Euclidean space, you have to close up and close. And so this you can make flat infinity if it had Positive curvature at only S to this, actually. You can make it positive curvature at infinity if you wish, but this you cannot. So this is a kind of baby kind of version, would be weak version of positive mass, because it says if mass is plus infinity, then you cannot make it flat inside. And uh, to understand kind of physical meaning of that, you have to consider the basic example. So again, again, I don't know what mass is, but, uh, but physicists also were motivated by the basic example in this Schwarz metric. So first, of course, it's very hard to write this name, yeah? It's again, there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something more than that. This actually I just read, just uh, here, the poor guy died 
during this First World War. And he uh, wrote this metric. So this would be, of course, not what I'm going to write, what geometers write, not what physicists write. Because it is, must be Lorentzian, I mean, uh, uh, Einsteinian metric, it must be in, 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 in indefinite space. But you look at the, uh, it's a Riemannian part. And this Riemannian part is the metric given by the following formula. It's a metric on R3 minus 0, right? So this is, uh, and this is conformally conformal to the Euclidean metric. So this Schwarzen is Euclidean metric with a factor. And the factor is 1 plus, uh, I, I write something, uh, it's, Euclidean. It certainly looks a little bit horrible. This M is mass. It's called mass by definition. And so it's, you see, it says I have to understand a little bit of this metric. So it is actually first reading certain articles, I misunderstood it, and thought that this has positive scalar curvature. In fact, it's supposed to be rich if it's flat. If it were not flat, Yes, yes, I just came in here, I found counterexample to the statement if you assume it's positive curvature. But it's flat, and so what I'm going to say will be okay. So this will be kind of a major instance of, of something having positive mass when it must be, must be here for positive. It's, it's, it's a formal that doesn't have singularities at zero. No, no, no of course it, 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 ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It might be flat to infinity, so when we go to infinity, this must be go to must go to one. And uh, formulas I just but you have to the, the picture of the space is like that. Right? It's symmetric. You read the sphere with respect to each symmetric. You can it's verify easily that if you take transformation, if I'm not mistaken, R goes m squared over four. 1 over r. This metric is invariant. And so inside there is a sphere of radius, well, I think it was this radius. And the uh, area of the sphere is 16 pi m over, over, over m, I guess. Yeah. Something like this. I keep forgetting here. Yeah. But this is a specific number. And this is what you can th think about what is a mass, yeah? So you see, it, it goes to Euclidean geometry, again, as if it's conical from this side, to, but much slower, right? So it is a, so cone goes kind of with a linear rate. But this goes only kind of, sec you know, it's, it's flat and then slightly, slightly, sl slightly slower than in Euclidean, only slightly. This is this mass. So you, you can see the spaces which are not like conical, but we approach Euclidean geometry much slower, much closer. I mean, I'm sorry, they're closer to Euclidean than cones, but may go be, be slightly above or slightly below. And that corresponds to the, that corresponds to the concept of a mass. Yeah. So this, this is the type of metric. But this was kind of essential. This has zero scalar curvature. And so there is some kind of theorem here, which I will state, state in a, a little while. But this is what mass is. But and then, of course, you, and then just you have to make different uh, attempts how to uh, correctly define it. And and uh, you know what I use standard definition I just cannot can swallow. Now, this about minimal surfaces and how they used. And then I said, aha, there are this high dimensional situation. So what you can do with high dimensional, and this was again in this idea, construction due to Sean Yao. What about high dimensional torus? Gerhard actually formulated conjecture in dimension three. I'm actually, I'm not certain where and how he formulated it. He said it on some meeting, because in the articles, what, what I, 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 I read of him, he said other things, and this may be implicit in, in that. But of course, yeah. there is no reason to distinguish number three. 
And of course, there is no, no more gauss bernier formula. But still, you know that in every homology class of the torus, of n-dimensional torus, there is this minimal object. But this minimal object is not always smooth. It o o it's known to be smooth only if n less or equal to 7, even if it is absolutely minimizing. And the first example appears for n equals 8. And this very simple example, you take S3 time S3 in in S7 in Euclidean space, so it's dimension 8. And you take this cone over it. This obviously sitting, nature sitting product of sphere. Take the cone, and this cone is minimizing. And it was big kind of discovery at some time, but if you kind of think from general principles, it reduces to some uh, it's very simple computation because if, if somebody is minim if it not absolutely minimizing, you can rotate it around and then all this intersection together do something smaller. So absolutely minimizing here because boundary is symmetric must be symmetric. And once it's symmetric, it becomes ODE. And so you have to look at this ordinary differential equation and see it necessarily develops singularity. And I don't know whether it's true or not, but this was was considered one of the counter example to the famous Hilbert problem, who said that if you have analytic elliptic equations, solution must be also analytic. And of course, the question is how you interpret it. So this cone is not strictly speaking analytic variety. It has a singularity. However, it's kind of an analytic object. Yeah, it's not something uh, uh, horrible. And it's still unknown if this is kind of uh, in general the case. And, and for different kind of equations, it was done, 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 done similarly the right equation, and there are singularities, and you know by symmetry, and they reduce the ODE, and then you solve the ODE, and then you see that for some, for some moment they develop singularities, which is kind of exercise, and actually some of them was a thesis of somebody in Leningrad who was solving another Hilbert problem. Of course, somebody put him, his professor told him to just look at this ODE, and he just solved it. But this dimension eight, yeah. But uh, but th this doesn't happen in lower dimensions, and this is a this is a really non-trivial. And again, there is a big theory for that developed by Federer and Fleming. I think uh, about that partly. I'm grand went somewhat further when they developed general theory of minimal surfaces. But they certainly they had no means to handle why there is no singularities. And this was done by really by very elaborate, in my view, incomprehensible computation, computational algorithm by, by Jim Simons, who just then extended this computation to the stock market also quite efficiently. And, uh, and this is a kind of the main result in the geometric measure theory that there is no singularities below dimension 7. And there is no kind of rational explanation. It's just computation. And then some numbers come out. And then another interesting point about this singularity, it's unstable. It's known to be unstable. We have singular this Singularity in this dimension eight, I move it a little bit. Either I move boundary condition or I slightly change the metric. Singularity disappears, and this was proven by son of Smale, not of Smale. It's again. I, I will shall later on explain. It's very transparent why it happens. It just requires no knowledge of, of minimal varieties, just general principles, which kind of again completely transparent. Transparent, but this is unknown for high dimensions. And this big issue, if it is what happens in big dimensions. And there is a bypassing of that due to Lockhamp, who recently published this paper. And he says, well, it's not exactly that, but you do it kind of, you have almost minimal variety, which is approximately minimal, and singularity disappears, which is for purposes of, of the present discussion sufficient. But his paper, this is a rather short paper, about 20 pages, but it's based on another 200 pages of other papers which are well, hard to read. So no, nobody, of course, checked it. And, but this must be true. I'm, I'm quite, quite and can, I just, there's a, all indication of that. Because when you try to uh, unrigorously think about that kind of obvious singularities must be unstable. But then there are some very pathological phenomena which may come up. So if you believe in this Hil Hilbert philosophy, of course, it must be so. But but except that this singularity when higher dimensional is so elaborate kind of can't set and, and, and being stable at the same time, which is hard to believe. But anyway, uh, accepting that, 
that you know this minimal hypersoft is there, what you can do with that? Now, you cannot apply gauss bernet You don't have gauss bernet But what you, do, what you do know is still, when you push it down, some expression is positive. And the expression which I wrote down was integral was psi squared. I'm sorry. D psi squared. Plus, I keep forgetting already, minus 1 half. And here is integral. For minimal varieties, other term disappears. And so your integral will be the second variation. It will be scalar of y. What's important, this quantity is positive. D, d squared, yeah. F phi, phi squared. Not here, phi squared. Psi squared. And so what it means, yeah? So on, on it says on this manifold that this term, when you integrate square differential, outweighs negativity of the scalar for all function psi. That you don't have too much negative curvature, right? If it were totally negative, you, 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 you wouldn't do that, right? But there is a little bit positivity, a little bit negativity. Right? So if you have not this term, not this psi, and just look at that, not, not the scalar curvature, it just says that the plus operator is positive. Right? So integral of, of d, d the psi squared, the only way is to be non-positive, non, 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 non to be zero, is constant functions. And here it's, it's kind of more positive than Laplace operator. So this point. And then, therefore, if you take for this operator, so op corresponding operator will be minus delta plus psi. Yeah. Right, look at this operator applied to function. Plus scalar curvature. Plus curvature, right. Pla pl plus, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one half scalar curvature, you're absolutely right. One quarter, one half. It's not one quarter, one half. It's it's one half. It's, it's, it's essential. It's, it's very important in many situations that one half is greater than one quarter, right? In some moment it's one quarter, but this this is kind of perfect perfect balance. One quarter is unclear why one quarter enters, and there are some other numbers enters in different dimensions. But this is a kind of, and therefore there is an eigenfunction. First eigenfunction will be positive. For this operator, this positive eigenfunction, well, we satisfy this you know, equation with positive eigenvalue. And then it's another computation, another formula, which I haven't written down. Uh, it's again written in, my, in what I put on the web, but here, uh, it's, it's again, you can, which you can be proven by pure thought, is that if you take now the following metric, have a manifold y, you multiply it by r, and you take the metric here, given by, it will be dy squared plus this function phi, call it, yeah? Phi squared dr squared. Then, because it was coming from this operator, this one metric will have positive scalar curvature, right? You just make some computation, ta -da -da, and get it, but again, uh, this, is a, this is a fact of life. And this exactly kind of, Exactly this one half enters there. It's exactly perfect condition. So it's if and only if. Right. You can do that. Therefore, I, I don't have metric of positive scalar curvature on y. But I get this metric on this manifold and I observe this metric invariant under translation. Now I can repeat this process. Now inside of y, I take kind of next y prime and kind of and, 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 and do it over there, but now because this was invariant at the R, after the second round become invariant under R2. And so I keep doing, 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 and eventually I come in fully invariant thing, so it will be Euclidean space, invariant metric of positive scalar curvature, boop, which is impossible. That's the logic of the proof. It was somewhat differently done originally, because uh, in the, in the, again, because if you use ready up to, that's usually what happens. You use what ready, ready there. You p plug in there and have complicated proof. But if you go directly, you see it like that. All you have to know what I said, but the key technical point is this, and it's hi highly unpleasant. This why there are the singularities 
because if you think a little bit about these formulas, the singularity is only kind of always in this problem in your favor. The more singular it is, all, all inequalities become only stronger. However, you cannot formally apply them. But I say more about that, what you can do about that. And so this proves that the torus scaling pneumatic of positive scaling curvature, but it doesn't tell you still much about the geometry. We don't know how to fully use that. And so how to enlarge, how to use this to extract geometric information. So far, it is topological information. And at the beginning, everybody was very happy proving this topological non-existent theorem. But from a certain perspective, who cares? So it doesn't exist, forget it. So what you do next? Eh? If you prove something, it doesn't exist. Not interesting. But still, it was kind of, it's like with rigidity theorem. People enjoy rigidity theorem. Something is rigid. And then what? So it, the formation doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Of course, it's only interesting if you can make the next step. And here, of course, you can make the next step, but you have to change perspective. But for that, it's useful, again, to look at this parallel with Dirac operator. So this was in a slightly different form done by in 79, I think, or maybe or eight, and I think it's 79, by Sean Yao. But 10 years, even more than that, yeah, in, in 63, as I said, Lichnirovis proved that there are the abstractions for positive scale curvature, and where the simplest example were hypersurfaces of in CP3. So this is a Kumba surface. Or you put here any 2K. Any surface of even degree that they don't have positive scalar curvature. Actually, now we know also for odd degree they don't have it. By more, by, by more sophisticated means, but this only limit to dimension four. But this was four, and, and just to, to be sure, it consists all dimensions. If you take this surface, this surface to any power, and it's still, and I multiplied many, 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 many such surfaces, they all have, all admit no metric of positive scalar coefficient. And the reason behind it is that you, uh, there is a contradiction. Of, of between two theorems, which I already mentioned. One is, is the schrodinger lichnirovich identity, which says that Dirac operator, whatever it is, is just operator, you don't know what it is, acting on some vector bundles. E taken square equals something positive, some positive operator, plus one quarter of the scalar coefficient. Therefore, if many for the positive scalar curvature, this has no kernel, in particular index of the operator itself must be zero. Of course, you must be careful what the mean square means, because when you say index, you map one space to another space. So this, this d squared is a little bit abbreviation of d times that, but because well, for some reason you can do it this way. Because it's organized in such a way, it makes sense, it depends how you define the operator. Right. So or precisely, you have to put it this way. So the Dirac operator has two paths, and they're being interchanged by, by And then th this is um, also, it applies to, to some class of possibilities. It tells you even less about the geometry of the manifold. So how we can bring in geometry? And for that, this part is much more transparent. and. Uh, Because. So, excuse me, so you said that the, the non existence comes from the. You have two, two results. So, so, one fact that. Yeah, one, one fact that this operator has non zero, uh, has this formula. And that has. What, what is the other one? I, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I didn't say it. Because it has non zero index by ICI index theorem. You can compute index in this example, it's non zero. And it's actually what is called, if you know, this is a roof genus. It's some, in dimension four, it's just signature up to a constant here. A signature of the manifold. But in high dimension, it's something else. It's some care, it's possessive of a first Pantriagin number in dimension four up to a constant. When you multiply them, this thing multiply. It's multiplicative. 
In high dimension, it's tricky expression, so why I didn't say it. So for for for, for, for four dimensional manifold, just say Pantriag, if Pantriagin number doesn't vanish, uh, then rational Pantriagin number doesn't vanish, then index is non zero. When you multiply, it's also index is multiplicative. It's rather tricky in variant, by the way, I must say. It is not immediately clear the formula for high dimension written by Herzog, but Herzog is kind of not immediately clear in coming from Riemann Roch. Riemann Roch theorem, first proven by Herzbruch here. Yeah? And uh, but then if you think about what is the index of an operator, for in particular operator D, and then it is not only for given ma so, of manifold. So one point which I so it was, uh, uh, should be kind of emphasized, it only makes sense if your manifold is spin manifold. It's, it's, it's otherwise, it defined, it's defined always locally, but only up to plus minus sign, Dirac operator. And be, to be sure it has constant definite sign, you need something like orientation, which is slightly different. It's kind of orientation on a one dimension up being spin. And sufficient condition, just not to bother about exactly too much about that, of manifold being spin, is vanishing of, of this group. If it is zero, it's always spin, <coughs> right? Uh, but by the way, these surfaces are not, uh, and, and, and uh, the, 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 this condition not satisfied for, 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 for surfaces in the co complex projective space, but for even dimension, they spin. For odd dimension, they are not spin. And, uh, yeah. and, and so once you know it, you know the theorem, but it's, you know, your understanding of geometry is very limited. And then, but you, for, 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 case, for, for here, here you know it very well that <coughs> Index is not a number in, in, in truth, but index give you a function on vector bundles on the manifold. So it's a, what is called K homology class. To so each vector bundle manifold, it give you a number because you can twist Dirac operator with every vector bundle, say a complex vector bundle of a manifold, right? So you have differential operator, like you have you just repeat this uh, if your bundle is flat, so you just it's you have just it takes of dimension of rank k, you just take d plus d plus d k times. It's kind of trivial thing. But bundle is not bundle is not flat, but it has flat connection, flat unitary connection like any bundle. And then so it flat up to high order terms. D rock first order operator. So you can make this twist. And it doesn't depend on choice connection. Index doesn't depend on choice connection. And uh, so you assign now number to each vector bundle. And therefore, you have to always think about all these twists. And this tremendously changed perspective. And uh, as far as topology is concerned, and this was kind of an essential implicit co contribution to the theory, this was the following argument to Lustig related to Neuigoff conjecture, where he Prove the version of Novikov conjecture. I don't. Uh, let me give you, for say, for example, for manifolds of 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 negative curvature, say, say for surfaces or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, actually, it was originally done for the torus, but but it's more transparent to mention. You have like product of Riemann surfaces. You don't have much Pontryagin numbers. We take such manifold product of Riemann surfaces. And the theorem says if you change smooth structure, still all Pantriagin numbers are zero. All the same of the torus. Right. M m this already is significant. You take a torus you, and uh, take any smooth structure, still all Pantriagin numbers must be zero. You cannot change Pantriagin numbers of, of these manifolds B by ch changing smooth structure. Because they are spherical manifolds, so everything determined by fundamental groups. So in one example, the zero must be always zero. For rational classes, uh, for integer, I'm not certain. Mod two, there may be some problems. And so, what was his his argument? So the point was to express this somehow in terms of fundamental group. Now, Pantriagin numbers and or classes enter the index theorem. So, index theorem has two terms to it. When you have the Dirac operator or another signature operator which appears in a second, you twist it with L. 
the index of this has two terms. This is one a roof, something depending on structure of manifold attached to this, and this is a tricky term. Another is simple term, plus churn of L. It's some combination of churn classes of L. So, and this is completely of, of, of different kind of significance. Yeah. So this is at attached to manifold, and this kind of external thing, and this is much easier to handle, to understand what happens when you change this bundle and, 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 and prove the difference. You have one bundle and another bundle, and take the difference, this will cancel off, and then the formula becomes much easier. And the proof of it is much easier, right? And it's originally, in the proof of Herzebruch at the Ribbon Rock theorem, he first proved that in this kind of elementary, kind of more or less algebraic geometry, and then there is a tricky point to extract this. And the same, as we shall see, for both for signature and for that, they play different law. This kind of a weak term, and this is a strong term, and this is more, more delicate. On the other hand, this tells you nothing about geometry. Amazingly, this tells a lot if you apply it to that. And what it corresponds, what happens to, okay, what parallel logic you can observe for, for Mm. Minimal surfaces. So what corresponds to this kind of variation of that? And that, instead of considering minimal surfaces, which minimize, minimize just say area, for simplicity, uh, area of y, you add here a weak term. So you think this surface bounds something, some region, and so your y is boundary of some domain v inside of x. And you have some function on, on the domain. Actually, it might be measure. It doesn't have to be function. It's even better, but say it be function. Well, no, actually, I prefer to say it measure. But in applications, sometimes function, or sometimes function so, 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 so it cannot be too singular measure. In, in your quantity, which you minimize, we minimize area of y minus or plus, but depending on convention, measure of this v. Remember, this is power. So it's a weak term. Right. So, uh, this kind of isoperimetric problem. But you, you sometimes you formulate it in, 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 say, you take area bounding minimal volume. And it's a bad way to say it. Right. It just com completely kind of doesn't give you right perspective. Of course, sometimes it's the same. When this function is constant, it's more or less the same. But this is a kind of the right way to think about that. And fish is called something brains or something. Yeah, it is very funny also physical terminology, which came of course later in this case. I don't think it was. Uh, it appears in later literature, and solution to that, when you have a solution to that, this extreme object will have me mean curvature exactly this one, and this gives you much more flexibility because you can choose this mu the way you want, or it's, it's something now applied to all functions mu. So this, all these functions play the role of all these vector bundles. And so this variational problem, it, it has got the right hand side, right? It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's not certainly pleasant to have equation delta f equals to zero, but also it's even better to have it equal to some function phi. So you have a really non-homogeneous equation. And this is, and when you do that both with vector bundles and with, with vector function, you can accommodate them to the geometry of your manifold. Right, so both vector bundle kind of reflect property of this bundle, reflect geometry of the manifolds, and existence and non-existence of function with certain properties also easily related to geometry of the manifold, and thus you get get these results. So let instance of that, just mimicking some argument of Lucy, it's very simple. How you prove alternatively? That the, on the torus, there is no medical positive scalar curvature. If you take Dirac operator itself, well, it's flat. So Dirac operator is essentially the same as like a square root of Laplace operator, so only solution of constants, so there is no nothing. Index theorem is vacuous. There is no in index is zero. However, if you twist it with, with flat bundle, then locally it will be the same. So, so twisted with flat bundle. 
So it, it actually you, do, you, you, you go slightly beyond what I said before, by the way, how you understand index theorem. But I, I, I twist it with a flat bundle. When I make this, of course, the f local formulas will remain the same. It still will have the same positivity or negativity. So if this would have positive scalar curvature, this also would have no kernel equal kernel. So, but if you are free with individual flat bundle, of course, nothing happens. It still has zero index. Excuse me. The, so the flat bundle, how is it related to the, to the metric? Wait, 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 wait. OK, I, I haven't finished. So far, it's not related to the metric. But the existence of flat bundles depends on the presence of fundamental group. So at, at this level, I only show how a fundamental group in, interferes with the other picture. So far, the fundamental group was not there. And, and this, by the way, what I'm saying is kind of the beginning of all this huge development system, algebras, you know, in the of conjecture, et cetera, generalizes this pattern. But now it is fundamental group enters. In a second, they say how to make it more geometric. So far, it's not very geometric, but it's in the right direction. So when you have this one flat bundle, it is no good. However, if you have an n-dimensional torus, that all flat bundles, and namely complex flat unitary bundles or S1 bundles, they make a dual torus, right? It's just the dual torus corresponding to all the representation of this fundamental group in this circle. So I have many bundles. And now they have the whole family of these bundles. Therefore, when I consider these indices, so I have now a family of bundles. And, and index theorem doesn't tell you anything about what happened in individual fiber. But it tells you if you take indices everywhere, but somewhere it must appear. Because index now takes value not in numbers at all, but in the vector bundles in this dual space, right? We have family of these bundles, of, 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 of this kind of, we have what, you, what, what the Lipschitz operator? It, it map between two spaces, two Hilbert space A, B. And this operator is Fred Holm. Fred Holm meaning it has finite dimensional kernel and co kernel. So unless, though they're infinite dimensional, they difference well-defined vec vector space. So when you have family of them, you have a vector bundle. Of course, you have to say it precisely. There is little kind of way to think how to say it precisely. Uh, you have to observe that all this concept admits some relaxation. It still makes sense. But what you get is a vector bundle here. And, is, and then index expressed in terms of the characteristic of, of churn classes of this bundle. This is actually a complex vector bundle, some churn classes. And if it's even dimensional torus, again, the index theorem for families, you touch the index says, aha, uh -huh, and this was used for Lustig for different purposes. It has non-zero index, meaning that at some moment, for some values of parameters, no matter which metric is there, there must be a non-trivial kernel. And so and therefore, it is abstraction to that. And, but this is still doesn't tell you anything about geometry. right? It's still only about fundamental group. But now, let's give another. This was yes, uh, with Dirac operator one proof. Now let me give another proof. without using families. So what I was using here, that even if even, even, even I have a flat, then still this squared will have the same formula. Something positive, something positive plus one quarter of scalar curvature. But now imagine it's flat, it's, it's slightly perturbed. It's not flat, but small perturbation of flat. Then you have this term according to some term plus epsilon. It's epsilon prime. Now, how we can make it? How we can create now a single, with no, no family at all, but individual operator, individual vector bundle, which will be almost flat. And this is now geometry enters. So you have to be careful what you understand in, in this flatness, how you measure this flatness. And uh, so what measures bundles being flat or being, or being non-flat? What makes kind of structure in the bundle? So this is a connection. So I have a vector bundle, and there is a horizontal field. 
and there is parallel transport, right? And so there are operators when going around the holonomy. Flat meaning if it is a small circle, this operator is identity. Almost flat might be close to identity. So what means close? And this is a tricky point. In what topology? And this is operator topology. So each vector moves by small amount. And the constant involved here, which is essential as epsilon, doesn't depend on the rank of the bundle. No matter how big it is, if each, ve each vector moves to more by epsilon, it's okay for this formula. And this, of course, you have to a little bit think, but again, follows from general principles. And that's kind of crucial for all the sister algebras, because the sister algebras do exactly make completion in this norm. Right? Why you can kind of go to infinite dimensional thing, but, 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 but the point is there. And, but how you can create these almost flat bundles? And this is, for, for example, for, for the torus. So I want to say that now that for any vector bundle, at least a multiple of this bundle can be realized when you have connection as flat as you want. The moment I, knew, I know that, I take the bundle which gives you non trivial churn class in this uh, index formula, and then apply that and come to contribution. But now geometry enters. On which manifold I can do that? So, so that's that, that's a little bit the issue, and this is a little bit geometric. I have a manifold x, in a, and I'm asking if, the, for, for given epsilon, there is a vector bundle, it must be a unitary vector bundle, so complex vector bundle, such that it will be epsilon flat on one hand. On the other hand, some churn number of L will be non zero. It's a churn number, it's not first churn number, it's some top dimensional churn uh, element, the churn character must be non zero. So it must enter non-trivially. It requires little computation why this is sufficient. Because f in, in the index formula, what enters is particular characteristic class. But if you take the whole kind of algebra, the tensor algebra with Adam's separation, it's enough. So, but this is minor algebraic point. So when you can do that? And so I, I'm saying it is now a geometric property a priori of your space which a posteriori will be, will be, will be, will be, <coughs> it will be uh, topological, right? Because I have a concrete, a specific remain manifold, I take some charts, in each charts I take the small loops, and it all depends on geometry and the length of these loops, and with respect to this set of loops, I want to choose this bundle. But then you can show the a posteriori, because epsilon may be arbitrarily small, you don't fix this epsilon, right? Then depends only on topology. Therefore, for every manifold, we have this invariant, yeah, which I call, which is, by the way, in a second, I will modify it, yeah. It is kind of, well, to be strictly called terminology called length. It's not area, yeah. Area we enter in, in a second later. So how we can, Produce such bundles. So this is but this so this is geometric invariant. This minimal epsilon, so I can create a vector bundle with these properties. And this is kind of hard, maybe it's a little bit kind of general. You may have you know yes, you have to understand how both bundles are, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is very simple criterion, which is now truly geometric. And this is follows. Say for compact manifold x of dimension n, I can do the following thing. I can map them to the sphere by some map such that this map has non-zero degree. And assume n is even. As odd, you usually have to be more careful and use odd index theorem. And you ask how big differential this map can be. And what I'm saying that if this less than epsilon, then again, slightly different epsilon, I have this small epsilon. So if I can construct a map here, and degree is non-zero, but still map rather contracting, then it will have such a bundle. And here is quite, quite easy. So what I do, I yeah, just take, stand any vector bundle here, it's even dimensional sphere, with non-zero churn class, and take pull back of this, and, 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 and whatever, size of the 
non-flatness was here, it, it will multiply by this epsilon. In fact, there is perfect choice here. Right? There is a perfect choice. In a second, I explain what is the perfect choice of this bundle L, pointed out by, actually by Blaine and worked out by his student, by Blaine Lawson. So, but first, being rather careful, <coughs> but now how to, how to reduce the topos? Look, for example, for the torus. If I take this n torus, it goes to Sn with some geometry, but you have no control about this gf. Yeah, it's something. But what you can do for the torus, you can take phi order, take covering of, of, of very large degree, and then torus become huge. This huge torus, I can shrink back to this size, become more of a size, map here. Now epsilon as small as I want. But of course, now my bundle lives here, not here. But there is a push forward map. And push forward map, I just rotate. So according to the monodromy of this transformation, add up all these bundles. And because my norm was operator norm, it doesn't add up. You see? And that's crucial. You don't add the norm, become soup. And that's very kind of essential point, yeah? As I said, this make possibility to go to infinite dimensional situation and still kind of theory works, right? So that's the point. So uh, th you can take a manifold, take sufficiently fine large covering, and if this covering go to the sphere with non-zero degree and by contractible map, it's okay. Of course, this depends on special feature of the fundamental group, which is residually finite. But in general, you don't want to make this assumption, but always in this kind of theory, it's okay. Imagine you just have infinite covering. You have your x, and here is infinite covering, and this infinite covering admits a map to the sphere with non-zero degree and very contracting. For example, imagine this manifold is roughly like Euclidean space. Euclidean space, you can compress as much as you want, and map anywhere you want, and when I say non-zero degree, I mean infinity goes to one point, so a degree makes sense. Then, again, I have vector bundle here, as flat as I want, but when I go down here, when I said aging them up, it's infinite sum. And so I have little trouble. And so, so what you do, again, you relativize. You, know, you cannot define it for one bundle, so we say, aha, you must have, again, something like map between two bundles. So you define, your, instead of vector bundle, you define them by, by short exact sequences, and so this makes sense. And so the object you have it will be kind of, again, Fred Holm operator and index defined by that. It's again, it's technicality, but the principle is if ev something, because again, the norm was operator norm. It's very insensitive to the number of terms, uh, fully insensitive how many terms you add. Therefore, you can go to infinity and make sense of that. And that is what these styles are doing. They make sense of this kind of rather simple thing. And then immediately you have a score of manifolds and you have geometric criteria I have geometric criteria about mm, existence, non-existence scaly curvature. When you can go from there. And here, now, maybe I just. So this still, we are very much related to the fundamental group. How we can go away from that? And so there are two paths. So, so so first, uh, maybe at this point already it's worthwhile compare advantages and limitations of these approaches. Here, by the way, when I map to the sphere, if you look slightly more carefully at the formulas, when you write this formula d squared tensor with L equal positive squared plus one quarter scale plus something else, this something else depends on the curvature of this bundle. It's some expression depending on curvature of the bundle. And again, it's a norm of the curvature, right? So what advantage of this expression? Because it says it's not important so much what was differential of this map. But it was, it was, it was essential what was the norm of the exterior power, first exterior power of that. How much it was contracting or, the, or compressing surfaces. And this is a different geometric feature. Right? So it's not so much length involved, but area which is involved. So that's one pro property. So manifold doesn't have to be large. To so again, the idea behind positivity of curvature 
that many for this positive curvature tend to be small. And this says that this cannot be large area wise. It may be it, it may be kind of long like that, yeah, but cannot spread in two directions. It may spread in three dimensions, it doesn't go beyond that, yeah. Curvature is two dimensional object. So and uh, so, so this is kind of characteristic feature of that. Of, of this approach, it tells you about manifold with positive scalar curvature. Here they are compact manifold. Or this applies to complete manifolds. So for closed manifold, for complete manifold, and also for manifolds looking like that, which I explain later on. This is the most interesting contribution due to John Rowe, who just said died recently. You may have small part of the boundary. You don't have to be complete in one direction. It must have infinite part, but it must terminate somewhere. So this gives you some, some information. But, but the basic limitation, it doesn't apply, for example, to the ball or anything with compact with boundary. There is no meaningful, I'm, su I'm sure there is, yeah, but it's for the moment. A theory of Dirac operator for, for such manifolds. It might be some degenerate object which is not quite Dirac operator. Something can be done, but uh, so so many questions remain remain open. So this is uh, one limitation, and the second, you need spin everywhere. Manifold must be spin, or more precisely, the universal coverage must be spin, or something somebody else must be spin. But for very simple <coughs> cases, you cannot handle. The theorem, for example, if you have a torus, four dimensional torus, they connected some with C, P, 2. Yeah. And you cannot rule metric of positive scalar curvature here. And in a way, you can construct such a metric everywhere will have positive curvature in tiny little piece negative here. So it's not kind of a joke. But they connected some of two things with kind of positive and non-negative curvature. Everywhere you have a lot of positive curvature, but this will be really little, little, very small neck. And this neck is mostly be small. And I maybe not today explain this Penrose inequality, but in, in one case it says a very tiny little phenomenon, place where it, it's there, but it's not everywhere. So, so, but on the other hand, minimal surface is absolutely oblivious uh, of, of this spin, yeah. They work they have probably a little bit with singularities. And they, as we see, they apply to many for these boundaries. And which is more or less the same as you throw in with this extra mu. But they tell you nothing about area. It's impossible to, to say something about area. Now, what are kind of ultimate kind of results which I want to present now? So one of them, the first one, was just as I said one done by some following suggestion by Blaine Lawson by his student in the following theorem, which I think is quite impressive, which says if I have a manifold of positive scary curvature. I'm sorry, scary curvature greater than that of the sphere. It's positive, but it's greater than of the sphere. And it goes to the sphere F. It goes to the sphere F by map with non-zero degree. Then, in fact, scary curvature is equal to this number. Ah, no, no, I'm sorry, I didn't finish it. And such that the exterior power of the f less than one, which means that all surfaces may become only shorter. Area of, uh, only goes down under this map. Then, this map actually is well, except dimension two, there is something exceptional. It's a something. So you cannot enlarge the metric in the sphere. Yeah, but I'm sorry. This must be spin. Or if you look a little bit better, you need universal covering to be spin. Then it's slightly more, more, more technical. But essentially, you need spin condition. In dimension, and in dimension four, probably you can prove it, uh, can prove it without spin condition. But for other dimension, you need spin. And uh, 
And this is actually extremely annoying they need a spin condition. Yeah. It's such a nice general geometric theorem. It says you cannot enlarge. Of course, if you don't change topology, no problem. You cannot enlarge matter on the sphere. Enlarge even not only length-wise, but only area-wise, such that scalar curvature necessarily somewhere goes down. What, by the way, is unknown, if you don't f say anything about enlargement, which may be true, at least some, that's some indication to that. If you take a small piece of a sphere without caring what happened there, and can you modify metric at all being localized in a small ball? So the scalar curvature goes up. So one knows if you allow this deformation in the hemisphere, it's possible. If you take sphere, I've forgotten exactly, of particular radius, you cannot do it by small deformation. But in general, for example, that's unclear. Right? And again, it's, it's, I explain again why it's quite delicate, because if negative curvature enters, a tiny little place where it enters, completely invisible, but somehow crucial, <coughs> crucial for this phenomenon. So this is a theorem due to Laroux. And uh, kind of a big problem is to eliminate his spin. And the, even if you take map just without area, it is in, in, in from dimension five on, you need spin, strangely enough. And so the, the, the point is just, if you again start comparing, um, and then we ask, what if you puncture me, or you take manifold slightly smaller than sphere, take something half sphere, and just what we, I shall explain later on, if you take puncture sphere, it's still true. You can't enlarge metric in a punctured sphere without scalar curvature going down, but then it's, it's also in its spin, but then you do it combining combining this and minimal kind of this minimal surfaces, or rather this surfaces with this mu term. You cannot prove it. So it says eventually that even if you take any any manifold whatsoever. Here, any spin eventually is true without spin. You can't enlarge it metric even with its boundary. If you start enlarging it and it has positive scalar curvature, it eventually must become small. But exact bounds for that are, are not, not terribly clear. And so this will be a kind of a, what I will be going to prove, I'm going to prove in my following lectures, various instances of that. Of that. So that's the, that's the, the, the situation. But again, I want to emphasize the following point. That so because in this index theorem, there are two terms. One of this a roof of manifold, and another is churn of the bundle. By which you twist. And this one, of course, kind of spin in inevitable here. In all results, when there is not know this term, only that one, we know theorem is just not true without assumption of being spin. Easily, there are counter examples. On the other hand, if you take a subtract a relative case when this disappears, and only churn play the crew role, with your proof not vanishing, actually, by adopting some vector bundle, this ch ch churn bundle, spin seems to be irrelevant. And so both, both Kind of, the theory becomes very close to what you have obtained by, by, by minimal surfaces. So the whole theory definitely bifurcates at some point. So here either you have this pi 1, non-zero, and spin probably irrelevant, sometimes questionable. And another concerning manifold which are indeed spin and using kind of really full differential topology. And when you go in this direction, it seems differential topology become completely more or less irrelevant. You use kind of coarse geometry rather than your homotopy theory, and differential things disappear. Of course, exceptional is dimension four. And some more special also dimension three. They're special, and they're not entering here. Now, so how this uh, kind of uh, uh, geometry can be encoded, how we can see this Dirac operator even before they come into, into play. Because you see, this is, they look extremely uh, artificial. They still look like artificial. The minimal surfaces geometrically don't look artificial. They are natural objects. The remarkable thing, of course, that the, the, uh, there is this formula. That for second variation, I, I repeat, 
it is just what enters is scalar x, scalar y minus scalar x. The scalar of the ambient manifold, it, it's not it, it ab absolutely obvious why it enters. It's little computation. Uh, I think it was this kind of formula which I was writing, more or less. It equal. This, is, this was the formula which is little algebra which interferes. And when you use this formula for the Dirac operator, it's kind of similar, similar computation involved. Though here you use spinners and Clifford algebras, but it's again some symmetrization argument involved. And, uh, the question is, well, I think the, the main issue, in my view, the most kind of challenging and annoying, is actually direct link between the two. So you see the algebra is similar, but again, there is no even algebraically kind of absolutely parallel treatment. So, and so from this formula, which is purely kind of, if you look at the bottom, this algebraic formula, analysis is not involved. Analysis was involved when you relate d and d squared. So why vanishing of this kernel of d squared and vanishing of d essentially the same? For that, you need manifold to be either compact or, under some case, complete, and so you have index theorem. B but this formula was purely algebraic. Also here, this formula has nothing to do with analysis, with integration, with minimization. It's just pure algebra, of, uh, depending on pure linear algebra. And so any time you have such a nice linear algebra, it usually have manifestation. In, in, in geometry, probably it must have kind of extension here also, which kind of they might be linked by something algebraically more general. And then you can guess what can be analysis behind it. But, but anyway, it's kind of general. How can you say something about that for, for Dirac operator in you know, kind of other operators? And, and so what is this geometry which being involved? And, and how we can say it, and now I want to say a few words about uh, raw algebras. So again, I want to point out that there is a really kind of rather wide spectrum of things. So I'll be speaking about positive mass and relativity, and now we come to this uh, amusing algebra. How we can encode a coarse geometry of space x, the metric space, algebraically, and, and, and why differential or some elliptic operators enter, enter this game. And uh, so, so, which in particular, when you have a group, when you have a space x, and it x is by a group gamma, gamma x by isometries, and a discrete group is compact quotient. Then x and gamma are closely related. They're kind of geometrically very similar. On the large scale, if you go look from FR, all points merge together and you see your x. And so this space is kind of roughly the same. And now, but, but there is a nice way to linearize it and, and go to the framework of sister algebras. And this is what I want to explain now. And then kind of differential apparatus or elliptic operators will be kind of formally linked to that. So as I mentioned before, this, this prior to that, I say just one word again. So I was describing all these formulas, et cetera, but then there is formalization of what I say in, in terms of sister algebras. So you don't, you don't know, don't have to know what they are. There's some infinite dimensional objects, linear algebraic objects, period. But they serve some purpose of the following kind. The, the infinite that Hilbert space, as for me, his sister algebra is a Hilbert space with, with some extra structure, right? It has some extra structure, which is make it look like finite dimensional space, though they're infinite dimensional. And as, as far as I do know of conjecture or our problem about scary curve, which is concerned, you can say, aha, I was Dirac operator twisting with finite dimensional bundles. Now they may be infinite dimensional. They must be of this kind. It is a Hilbert space acted by sister algebra. And then index still well defined. There is an index that may be zero or non-zero. 
right? But now it takes values, not in numbers. Like in, the, in some example, what we had before, we have family of vector bundles of a torus, family of flat vector bundles, was a dual torus. And then index was a family of, of linear spaces over this base parameter space, which was again a vector bundle. Right? So it was element of K theory of this modular space. Yeah, so it's class of these vector bundles. And this will be the same, but in the kind of philosophy of, of today, it will be like non-commutative space. So they represent this object family as if, as if it's family of bundles over some non-commutative space. But again, it has non-trivial characteristic class, and maybe zero or non-zero. But you don't know what, what you don't know much to know, to know much what I, about this. Yeah, I describe finite dimensional picture, and this is just formal generalization of that, for kind of, or the limit of that. And so the formalism is as follows: So you can see that you Dirac twisted with this bundle, and if, and, and there is an index theorem saying the index theorem properly formulated is true, index may be zero or non-zero. But the point of being non-zero. It says necessarily there must exist spinners satisfying Dirac equation. Now it's coefficient with the bundle, but with many, many Dirac. Therefore, if you can produce on, on such a manifold, such a sister algebra, such that the index of the twist operator non zero, there is no scale coverage, no positive scale coverage. Okay. So you have to produce, and the old construction I described before this bundles are more flat, ta ta ta. If your epsilon goes to zero, you go to the limit and have this infinite dimensional object. It, in, 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 as far as example are concerned, I don't think it gives you any new examples. At least I've never seen one, right? But lots of different, however, kind of version of that term. But the point is that it's very advantageous still to, to look at other sister algebras, which are not coming by this limit process. So yes, you don't just add infinitely many something, but something else. And this is kind of one way to, 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 to proceed. And conjecturally, there are enough of sister algebras. There are always such a, such a flat bundle over any, o, o, over any space which represents, uh, which has sufficiently many to represent non-zero non sections of everywhere. So it's lots of them. And they kind of allow you, prevent you from scaling curvature, which you don't need too many. Or for knowledge of conjecture, you need kind of really kind of wide spectrum of them to represent all K theory, all cohomology or homology of the space. But now come row algebra, which I think is very good, very nice class of these sister algebras. So it generalizes what, what, happens, what happens for the sister algebra of, of, of groups. So first, let's, let's do it, let's do it uh, geometrically. So given metric space x, this kind of a semi-group. As a quote row semi group, yeah. Which encodes very nicely large scale geometry of the space. And this is very kind of simple semi group. You consider just self mappings. Then you can kind of have to a little bit limit them, but they don't have even continuous from x to x, such that distance of x to fx less or equal c infinity. The constant depends on f, but doesn't depend on x. So you move everything by finite amount. If you compose such maps, then uh, you again have a map of this type. So motivation may be as follows. If you have a group, yes, you, you have an in, in infinite group. And you think about this group as a metric space which acts on itself by asymmetries. Right? You have a group, and you take a distance on a finite set, a finite generate, then translate it. So you have a distance defined there. Of course, this translation, except group is, is, is abelian, yeah, turns things a lot. But here there are two actions. Yeah, this is a kind of horrible thing to, to, to say. There is left action, and there is right action. And so nobody knows what it is. Yeah? And actually, it's not a definable notion. This is, by the way, one problem with mathematics. You cannot say rigorously what it means left action and right action. If you have my left hand, the right hand. So how you say it? If you space to speak somebody in the other universe where they have break of the symmetry, no. As you know, it's possible, and so you cannot tell. I mean, just what's left, what's right. So, so what, what it actually do? Somebody knows how to formalize it here. Yeah? 
it's, it's indeed it's a kind of tricky, yeah? And actually, but there are two actions. There are two, we you know, from different sides. But which is left, which is right, is of course we cannot say. And so, but, but again, in this geometric framework, one action turn things like that, and another action move everything by finite amount, right? And therefore, the semigroup is extension in this example, just extension of the whole group. And this perfectly, I think, is one to one. So, so I, I guess, I, I haven't thought about this carefully, but I think it's easy to say that if you have correspondence between two spaces, such that points which were within certain distance remain within boundary distance, remain within boundary distance, if and only if these two, if these two semigroups, well, in some sense equivalent. I wouldn't say so much here. Might be careful, but kind of equivalent in, in certain sense. And but this is still, this is still kind of groups in how we can go to algebras. But al already, yes, from some moment on, you can say, aha, you can forget you, you want to describe geometry, or your, your space for this purpose, in terms of the semigroup. So you have this manifold, you have a semigroup, you forgot about manifold. You only have the semigroup. In a second, you have to add something to that. And uh, what you do, you make out of this a sister algebra. But the problem is, first you have to make it to act on some Hilbert space. And here is this little problem, which I must admit I don't fully understand. But if the space is discrete, then there is an underlying measure, discrete measure on your space. And then there is Hilbert space, and then this act on this space. So we have a semi-group of operators of, of, of on the space, and then you can complete it by sister algebra. So what is completion? You can you take linear span of that, but completion you take operator norm. So two things are close, if on every vector they act closely. And this is a very weak norm. And that remarkable, so we have huge algebra, but still it carries enough kind of structure to remember about your space. So how much now, after this completion, how much of the geometry uh, remain, remains? I think there are many conjec conjectures which I don't, don't know too well. But the point is that you can now consider spaces which out have infinite spaces and without any action, uh, or any group of them, so really open manifolds and formulate existence or non-existence of, um, of metric opposite scalar curvature in terms of Dirac operator twisted with this algebra on this space. Of course, they are not compact, so I might be careful. However, it, it, is, it, it works, and so let me give an example and give some motivation so what you can see by elementary means and what not. So again, as usual, so when you go to the bottom, something rather simple being encoded, but sometime in a way you cannot see in a more elementary way. So it will be, I was saying there are this kind of, imagine you have this kind of space, which is infinite in one direction, it has this thing, and uh, imagine it has scaly curvature greater than a constant, if you have your right sigma scaly curvature. So I want to rule it out by some condition. You know, on principle, it might have easier space. But I suppose, just for simplicity, that it's very topologically very simple space, like torus time positive ray. And let, let me just give some uh, partial uh, reasoning why it should be true. Actually, I must admit, I never fully understood this argument. I, I understand in, in, in some in some in some mm. basic cases, and there is alternative alternative proof of that. <laughs> but this is quite 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 instructive. So what you do? So the th the theorem is that if you take this uh, uh, you take algebra of of this space and and, it, and uh, so of this space this row algebra and twisted with sister algebra of that, then it has non-zero index. So you have to make some computation, you have this kind of, and this sister algebra convenient, but the way this geometric construction, they're a little bit harder to manipulate, yeah? Like uh, this construction, you cannot take the tensor product immediately, you have to say many words. In sister algebra, everything goes into the one, in one boat. And I said before, in, in groups, you, 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 you have to keep track, yeah? 
you, you cannot keep everything's flat. You cannot say thing approximate. And this algebra partly kind of re 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 recapture that here. So manifold doesn't have to be doesn't have to be symmetric in any sense. No group should act. But the semi-group always act there, right on this space. And this semi-group, semi semi-group, what matters? This kind of translation, semi-group. And so, but how we can see it from from a different perspective? So you have this Dirac operator here. Imagine a really kind of this tube-like shape, and you have this Dirac operator, and you can imagine that you take if it was story total, you can take finite covering, so it's kind of a big and thick tube, yeah. It's kind of huge tube, and it goes, 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 goes. How Dirac operator can prevent you from happening that? Because Dirac operator feel very badly at this corner. It's not defined because of this boundary. So just stupid thing, you just double it. Now Dirac operator is defined, but of course there is no control of the geometry here. Right? Scaly curvature will be negative here. Right? So you only can use vanishing property. This formula at infinity, uh, but there will be some error coming in there. So what you can do there, bef before what I was saying, I was having manifold x mapped to the sphere with degree non-zero. Which is enough to have some contribution on non-zero index. But now, because I have such a huge, big thing, I can have degree greater than anything I want. So it may be huge. So I map the degree many, many times. And when it happens, of course, contribution to the index, index become bigger, bigger proportionally. So it means on this space, if it have a such a big and thick space, um, after twisting with this bundle, which is kind of minor, minor point, you have a huge number of sections. So here, and, and, and everywhere here, your formula says, aha, they're impossible. Therefore, all the section might be concentrated to this region, where we have absolutely no control. But there are many of them. And here still you have this formula. You have Dirac operator squared equal positive operator plus one quarter of scalar. Here, scalar is negative, so it's minus one. And so you compare with this operator. But this operator also has only f so many eigenvalues below this level. So there's a limit for that. So we say, oh, it's impossible. However, there is some weakness to this argument, which says, aha, that's good if you have this kind of picture, true tube. But theorem is true without that. Your manifold may become more and more narrow at infinity, but exponentially become small. And when you apply this kind of trick and do the same, you have to take high and higher covering and constant become bigger, bigger, and bigger, and you know where. However, and this is the point of this, this algebra, you can say, aha, uh -huh, no, the whole thing, you can go to this ideal limit, so to speak. You cannot go it on the level of operators, but on the level of formalism of raw algebra, you can pretend everything happens over there, and this becomes so far, this contribution still will be small. But then again, this is a kind of uh, nice point, however, I mean, I, I must admit, I haven't followed this argument to the end, but there is a, and still you need here, spin condition. You can prove it without spin, but using minimal hypersurfaces. So strangely enough, you can recapture of this kind of thing, say, from raw algebra for minimal hypersurfaces. However, directly, it's very unclear what they tell in this language. But, in, but I think it's extremely nice, uh, still very nice point of view, which allows you to speak about spaces, in purely algebraic term on the large scale by using this first semigroup and then this algebra. And there are, of course, the question how you complete it. And uh, technically, what happens, you don't work with Dirac operator, but you work with some kind of localized, lo lo localized version of Dirac operator. So there is kind of a little bit of analysis involved. And I hope maybe to, by, by the, at some moment I will understand it exactly because it's, you, you feel very uncomfortable with this argument exactly because kind of this contradiction, but then a posteriori, you know, it's true anyway from a different perspective, so this argument must work somehow, but, but and that's what's so interesting, of course, the spectral issues enter here very kind of essentially. It's not just index of the operator, but the whole spectrum enters in this geometry. And so positivity of the scaly curvature is just something on the bottom of the spectrum, and the rest of the curvature to talks 
to the other part of the spectrum of various operators or geometric object like this minimal surfaces where again in small dimension spectral there is a kind of indices of uh, Morse indices which correspond to the spectral enter so this will be only for the next time but again if you have questions just ask me because I know it's maybe I mean, maybe not always understandable yeah I'll put on the web something or, or the set already I, I put something and I, I, I keep kind of refreshing it and uh, many of course issues you will not be able to, to describe discuss here but but of course I put them there you can ask me about what is written there even not what it was not said here and I think the fun of that is that this really goes in different directions and they must converge that and they diverge sociologically because some people want relativity they never heard of this algebra in this operator and other, other people do otherwise it's amazing we have surveys written we have surveys here in curvature and each text each, each, uh, I never saw anything covering covering uh, <coughs> variety for example the theorem of La Larule and there is your generalization I think it's absolutely fantastic theorem the proof is very simple except some computation but it's a completely remarkable theorem in, in simplicity and if you don't know nobody mentioned to you dear cooperator just say on, on a sphere you can't enlarge the metric without changing scale curvature even just having graph of a function already there absolutely hopeless no geometric means otherwise we have to prove it you say dear cooperator it comes in spontaneously and it's a geometric theorem and I bring forth some other instances of that do something a very elementary geometric theorem and, uh, and you never guess uh, if you don't know a priori that you have to use these techniques coming and some of them even don't mention scalar curvature as I, I, was, I was giving some examples uh, last time but there is no scalar curvature involved so but again the point is there is two ways to think about that two opposite and both very valid kind of point of view one is global you look from infinity and so you see on the cost properties and want to inco and kind of re re relate them to curvature and the opposite the infinitesimal calculus there are just nice formulas and one there there you have, have to have some meaning but you have to know them and organize them in a certain way and it's like an, they're very simple formulas like this Bochner formula some this, this Clifford algebras or just uh, uh, Gauss formulas and, and related they're all related to symmetry and representation of certain simple groups and they give you this very nice formulas but un understanding their kind of development is not is not uh, apparent Thank you.